Wow. Thanks, Day. Uh, certainly your visit, and along with Kathy, was a, was a great deal of fun for me. One of the things that uh, I'll talk about perhaps as, as, I, as I go on, but I, that I, I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to serve. Uh, I worked hard at it, and I had a ton of fun. Uh, and certainly one of the fun things that I was delighted to do was to receive folks uh, who were coming from the U.S. or even from other places and to pal around with them. And uh, it was even more fun to do that with really neat people like Day and Kathy. So we climbed a mountain uh, and did a bunch of other fun stuff. Well, I thank you for those words, Day, and I thank each and all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm a little, I'm a little surprised at this, yeah? Uh, okay, I got to go back. There, this is the beginning. I'm a little surprised, but I certainly am really thrilled that uh, you all wanted to come hear me speak a bit about Iceland and, and my perspective on my service there. Uh, I was in Iceland for two full years. I was uh, confirmed by the Senate in mid-December of 2014, sworn in in a, a, a proceeding called a quick oath because the State Department wants to get you uh, uh, employed just as soon as you possibly can be uh, after after the Senate has, has confirmed an ambassador. Uh, so my quick oath actually was administered by my neighbor and friend, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and then my, yeah, I, I, I figured that might resonate with a couple of you anyway. Um, and my ceremonial swearing in uh, was uh, conducted by Vice President Biden in Washington in the uh, Indian Treaty Room within the Executive Office Building. Uh, soon after that, uh, I uh, got myself over to Iceland. I wanted to be there just as quickly as I could post swearing in because I knew, frankly, that my time was limited. Uh, uh, I was a political ambassador. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And uh, as all ambassadors serve at the pleasure of the president, uh, I was serving at the pleasure of a particular president. And come what may, I had no expectation that I would be there uh, beyond January 20th of 2017. So it took me a little while to get there. Uh, but once I did, uh, I was bound and determined to, uh, to get as much uh, uh, involvement and interaction with the country and I hope to accomplish as much or do as much good as I could uh, uh, while I was in country. So I was there from January 23rd of 2015 to January 20th of 2017. Perhaps I'll talk about my departure uh, near the end. A few background facts. Uh, I'm going to show you some maps, and this is the best of the four of them. I ask you to pardon me, because uh, my map selection wasn't the greatest. But here's Iceland. It's a country that uh, has about 340,000 people. Uh, the population has gone up a few thousand in, in recent years, not so much uh, because the Icelanders have uh, 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 engaged in population explosion, but because uh, it is a very attractive place to work for folks who are coming mostly from the European continent. Uh, Poland, the country chief among others, 
uh, because of the uh, explosion of the tourism industry. I'll talk about that in a second, too. It's about the size. It doesn't fit neatly. This is the, the sort of salmon colored, or in Icelandic, it's salmon. Just that's your first word of Icelandic. Uh, but that's the state of Maine underneath uh, upon which is imposed the, the Iceland, and they are, they are the, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, measurement, if you will. So you can see that Iceland, it's not the same shape as, as uh, Maine, but it's about the same size. And probably, although I didn't do this, it's about, if you think of, uh, of a country that's about the size of the other five New England states, so either Massachusetts and the others around us, or Maine, as the case may be. Iceland sits uh, here, as you can understand, and it is uh, all by its lonesome out in the North Atlantic, uh, with Greenland just to the west. As you can see, this is Norway and Sweden and Finland here, there, and obviously the United Kingdom uh, to, the, to the south, and here we are somewhere around, probably there. Uh, I'll talk uh, about something that came to be a rather significant issue or set of issues during my time in Iceland uh, a little bit later, but it involves this sea area that is on either side of, of the island. Uh, this is a, uh, again, I apologize, not a great map, but it's a perspective that uh, was part of my uh, training about Iceland, and it is looking at this world of ours from the top down, from the North Pole in the center, and you can see how countries relate to one another uh, from the perspective of the, the top of this globe, rather than the, probably the map or the, that we see, which is North America in the center, and then the rest of the world sort of around or kind of spread oddly around the United States. But this, what this uh, depiction also uh, uh, does to inform us is it identifies the eight countries which have uh, land area within the Arctic Circle. And it is those eight countries, Denmark with Greenland, Canada, Iceland, the US of course with Alaska, Russia and Sweden, uh, Finland and Norway, which make up the eight members of the Arctic Council, uh, a very important international body, uh, and one in which the United States, among these other nations, engages with Russia, even these days engages, and I would say constructively with Russia. I'll speak about that in a little bit. Oh, you recognize that guy. So, uh, Iceland is, uh, as I say, about 340,000 strong. It's an energetic, entrepreneurial, and I found very engaging uh, people with a very strong sense of social responsibility. Uh, always it is among the top countries and peoples uh, on any survey rating peacefulness or happiness, right? The Nordics are always at the top. They're generally and genuinely happy, but I think Iceland uh, is, is certainly one of those, and sometimes it tops the charts, as the case may be. Uh, Iceland has no standing military, hasn't uh, uh, ever really, since the, uh, the Viking chieftains stopped fighting with one another. Uh, it, it does maintain a Coast Guard. The Icelandic Coast Guard is 240 persons strong. Uh, and its security and defense arrangements are uh, tethered bilaterally to the United States. Uh, 
uh, something about which I'll speak a little more later, uh, but uh, as a result of a, a bilateral defense treaty that was signed in 1951. The economy of Iceland is three principal pillars and a developing fourth. Uh, the first is fish and more fish. Uh, traditionally, it has been the largest sector of the Icelandic economy with about 90 some odd percent of the, the seafood product caught uh, prepared for export. And uh, it is a part of the reason why uh, nature and climate issues are, are so very important to Icelanders. That's one, energy is the second, and energy is an export product, which might sound a little bit odd, but what, what I mean by that is the, the uh, geothermal and hydro uh, uh, provided energy, renewable resources, both, uh, power, almost all of the energy consumed in Iceland, it's 99 some odd percent, of that which is used for, for uh, heat or electricity around the country, uh, and, but for engines, uh, for vessels or vehicles, Iceland would be almost 100% renewably, renewable energy powered. But uh, there are a number of industries which bring product into Iceland, and chief among those are the aluminum uh, industry, which brings uh, raw bauxite into the country, smelts it, that is processes it, into aluminum, and then exports that finished product. And it's a rather odd thing to do, except if you consider that energy is both cheap and abundant, and has that additional feature, as I mentioned a little a moment ago of being uh, uh, from renewable resource. The third leg, and it has developed mightily in the last uh, six or seven years, is tourism. And uh, last year, I think it was very close to, it was more than a million six and just under uh, two million. And I think that Iceland may be hitting two million visitors tourist visitors in this year, uh, 2017. And this year, I think more than 8 million people, including those 2 million, are actually traveling to the other 6 million are simply transiting straight through Iceland. So it's a, it's a major in industry. Uh, there are actually more U.S. citizens that visit Iceland each year than there are Icelanders who live there. Uh, and uh, it's a great boon to the economy, to be sure. I mentioned earlier the employment in the country is uh, under 2%, and I think it's probably well under 2%, and uh, so low that, that the country is attracting workers from, from other countries in order to uh, take advantage of the labor market, or the scarcity in the labor market there. So those are the three main pillars. The fourth that is a developing one is innovation. Iceland, as I mentioned earlier, is a country full of entrepreneurs. I think that ingenuity is in the Icelandic DNA. And in part, this is, in my opinion, uh, something that was historically necessary for survival. I think that's actually probably more factual than opinion. If Icelanders had to be inventive and creative in order to survive uh, in, in those times, certainly before uh, the, the discovery of the, of the geothermal energy and the potential for its exploitation uh, came to be fully realized. Uh, the embassy in Iceland uh, functions uh, just like embassies in the 230, I think it is, some odd missions that the United States maintains in, in, uh, in overseas countries. Not all of these, of course, are embassies 
that serve a country or two countries, as the case may be. There are also, uh, there are also uh, ambassador level uh, appointees to a number of international organizations, NATO, the EU, various offices within the United Nations and so forth. But the, 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 the embassy itself in, in Iceland uh, is headed by an ambassador. Uh, the ambassador may be uh, someone who's not a career foreign service officer. I'll come back to that in, in a little bit. Uh, but always the deputy chief of mission in an embassy is a career foreign service officer. And the other Americans who work in an embassy uh, are State Department employees. They may be foreign service or they may be civil service, but they're employees of the State Department. So there's an ambassador, there's a deputy chief of mission, and then there are uh, heads of various sections within an embassy. And these range from a political section to a commercial section, uh, to a public affairs uh, uh, section, to, to uh, uh, a defense attache, and, and a, a, a fairly uh, extensive management section. And there are, there are others as well. In some, in some countries, uh, there are representatives from other uh, departments within the United States government. Uh, Iceland is served in part by representatives from, say, the Department of Commerce or, or the FBI even, or, or other agencies. For the most part, those folks don't sit uh, in Iceland. Uh, on a permanent basis. We, we did during my time in Iceland and because in, in great part because of the intensifying security related issues, uh, we did secure uh, a non-State Department uh, full-time uh, employee or assignee and that was the defense attache position that I mentioned earlier. What does an embassy do? Well, an embassy uh, really has three principal functions and many allied functions. Uh, first and foremost is to protect the security of US citizens who are in that country, whether on a permanent or semi-permanent uh, or temporary basis. And, and that's something that any ambassador, and certainly I, held very dear as a responsibility. Uh, the, the more often employed responsibility is that of advancing the interests of the United States across a variety of sectors, uh, and that is in respect to government-to-government -government relations, but also with the citizens of that nation and seeking to effect uh, and assist collaborations between and among uh, uh, folks in government, for sure, but organizations uh, or individuals uh, in, in the two countries. A third function, and it's a, it's a very important one, is the gathering of information about the particular host country and reporting that information back to the Department of State. And I don't mean that in the context of intelligence. That may well be part of a responsibility of an embassy or an ambassador. But it is in order to inform Washington, the State Department, back here about what is going on in a, in a, in a particular country, in Iceland. Uh, Iceland has in the last 14 months had two elections and it, it's rather critical that the State Department in Washington 
understand what it is that is happening, what it is we, the embassy thinks might be happening in order to be as prepared as possible for what, what might be the, the next developments. Uh, and so the, the ambassador as the chief of mission uh, is the personal representative of the president of the United States. Uh, that person, the ambassador, is in charge of all U.S. government activity that occurs within a given country. Uh, uh, whether it is activity that is that is uh, within sort of the core functions of an embassy, as I uh, gave you just a bit of a picture of, or uh, or whether it is uh, U.S. military activity within a country, that falls under the responsibility or that is those activities fall within the responsibility of, of the ambassador in country. Uh, so you might be wondering, having heard from a guy like Day Mount, who if you don't know, I'll tell you, is a career foreign service officer and uh, uh, was ambassador to Iceland for four years in the mid-1990s. Uh, Iceland has, has uh, most often been served by career foreign service officers who've achieved the rank of ambassador. Uh, but it, like about 30% of the posts, the overseas posts, uh, has sometimes had a so-called political ambassador or non-career ambassador. That's the more polite term, a non-career ambassador. And uh, uh, prior to my being nominated for the position, I think the prior four or five anyway ambassadors had been career foreign service officers. So how the heck did this guy, Rob Barber, get to be nominated and then confirmed and then go serve as the U.S. ambassador to Iceland? Well, I, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about that uh, because I, th I think it will inform a little bit of, of some of the other things that I am going to tell you about my experiences there. I I was very taken by Barack Obama. Uh, I'd, I'd heard a bit about him uh, before he spoke at the Democratic Convention in July of 2004. But I was fortunate enough to be able to be there in the hall and to hear him speak. And it was certainly as electrifying in person as I well imagine it was, because I saw that speech many times after as it was uh, on television. Uh, I decided that he was the guy for me. And I watched his career develop. He was, of course, elected to the Senate in November 2004. And I saw him as he came to Massachusetts in the fall of 2006. And I, uh, the talk was that he was considering a run for president. I heard him speak about that, was uh, so very impressed with his, uh, his uh, care and concern for his family, if he were to make that choice, uh, with his thoughtfulness about what it is that it takes to run for president. And I, I really decided that if he's running, I'm going to do whatever it is that I can to help him become the nominee and to help him uh, to be elected if he were the nominee. I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm formally trained as an advocate. I'm a lawyer, have been a practicing lawyer for 37 years before I went to Iceland and in the months that I've been back, uh, re-engaged. 
Uh, I understand what it is to be an advocate. I started selling dictionaries door to door when I was 16, uh, knocking on 100 doors a day during summer months. Uh, I, as a lawyer, I've been fortunate to have as clients uh, people whose cases uh, I believed in. So I, I uh, have been able to advocate for things that, that are meaningful to me personally. And, and there are causes pre-Obama about which I have been very passionate. Schools I've attended, uh, schools that my kids have attended, issues one place or another. So I know what it is to, uh, to believe in something and to advocate on, on behalf of that something. Uh, and so when there, I got a notice from a New England Lawyers for Obama group in formation, would you like to be part of this? I said, yeah, this is a way I can get involved for Barack Obama. I surprised myself, I surprised myself sometimes with my utter naivete. <laughs> Because I didn't realize initially, I came to realize that this New England Lawyers Group was really one aspect of a developing fundraising operation for the Obama campaign. Uh, but I joined in and I began to get involved in its activities. And, and as one part of it was raising money, I, I sort of applied myself uh, to that purpose. And, and I figured I'd give it a shot. And as it happened, I ended up being pretty good at it. Uh, and I, I didn't simply raise money, but I, I knocked on really hundreds and probably more doors, uh, something I was used to doing from childhood, but in nine different primary states, including Massachusetts, uh, spent many, many dozens of days up in New Hampshire uh, ahead of the New Hampshire primary. And then when he was lucky enough to take the nomination, uh, I, I worked very hard uh, on the ground for the general election too. I continued with all of these efforts and some of it was doing legal protection work on election days in one place or another. I continued with all of that through the, the first administration and then uh, re-engaged uh, in the in the re-elect uh, campaign, and I consider that my reward for that was that this man was elected, and then he was re-elected. For me, that was that was good enough. I was thrilled about it. Uh, uh, but when I was offered uh, the opportunity to serve in this administration, and in particular in this role as ambassador to Iceland, I jumped at the chance, uh, not knowing nearly so much about Iceland as I was to learn, but uh, I figured it was quite a privilege and I would, I would uh, do what I could to make the most of that. I, for this job, I received extraordinary preparation from the career folks at the Department of State. They do, they do a, a, uh, a great job of preparing every nominee, both for uh, the particular Senate hearing, the, the uh, confirmation hearing, but also uh, for all of the tasks that are to be confronted when one is at post. Uh, and I learned those materials that were provided to me and listened very carefully to the folks who were, who were my guides through the, that entire process. I was very lucky uh, to be preceded in Iceland by a terrific ambassador, immediately preceded, who is a career fellow, Luis Arriaga, now serving actually as U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala and by a deputy chief of mission who was in charge of the, of the embassy in the 14 months between when Luis left and I arrived, 
Paul O'Friel, who's a, a Newton native, actually, also a career Foreign Service officer. And they, they left for me really big shoes to fill, uh, which I think, frankly, was good news. I was coming in after a time Luis had followed an ambassador who had a bit of a rocky time in the country, and he had done quite a lot to repair the relationships with the United States. And Paulo Friel, the deputy chief who stepped up to run the embassy as Chargé in the 14-month gap, uh, did a great job too. So I, I worked hard to prepare, because one of the things I'd learned uh, along in my time, and it's not uh, terribly deep, and perhaps very obvious to, to folks is that, well, in a circumstance where I didn't have experience, preparation was the key. And I also knew from earlier work that I'd done uh, that personal relationships matter. And I had also received that advice, uh, that it was important in country to develop a personal relationship with key players, whether it be in government, in industry, in the education system, cultural, what, what have you. But most critically with government officials, because what that would support is those occasions when a difficult conversation needed to be had uh, about an issue that was a, uh, uh, in dispute or disagreement between our two countries. And, and if there is a trust-based personal relationship, then those difficult conversations are more easy to have. And I certainly found that uh, to be a critical bit of preparation, but also something that, that served me well uh, during my tenure in Iceland. Icelanders, I was told, like authentic. They're informal. And that was a relief to me because it suited very much my personality. And frankly, it enabled me to, to be myself and to develop uh, uh, in the context of performing uh, official duties, to be sure, and I was always conscious of that, but to, to employ my own personal style in, in doing that job. Uh, and, and I learned, certainly, that Icelanders were very interested in people who were interested in them. And for me, that was really easy to do to be interested in what was going on in Iceland. Uh, so uh, I, there are these pictures that are of me, and that's my, my wife and me with the president and son Ben, uh, uh, Michelle Obama, and this is, this is uh, swearing in on January 8th of 2015 by the vice president, and so sworn in I headed to the country. Uh, I got to live, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. I got to live in a residence that was different than that which Kathy and Day occupied. Uh, uh, I, I lived in a brand new sort of condo apartment that the State Department had purchased. It was at the top of a building uh, the top two floors with a lot of outdoor space and looking out over Mount Essia, uh, as you see here in the distance. And, and really, it was a 360-degree uh, view from up top, quite fancy, uh, for me, quite fancy. The, uh, uh, the, I, I should say the, the two primary buildings uh, are, of uh, our structures for an embassy are the chancery, which is the houses, the offices of an embassy, uh, and and the uh, chief of missions residence, the CMR. And in Iceland, from uh, uh, the late 1940s, around and about, 
for the next 60 years in, uh, in Reykjavik, these two functions were housed in buildings that were connected. They actually had a party wall and were connected internally. Uh, by the time I got there, actually before I got there, the State Department had determined that uh, 60 years of wear and tear uh, uh, had uh, and with some minimal but sort of patchwork modernization was just about enough. And uh, so it purchased this uh, kind of penthouse condominium that was a couple of miles away from, is a couple of miles away from the embassy. And in fact, uh, as we speak, there is a building that has been secured and is in the process of being rehabilitated for the new chancery, which is not proximate to, not next to the, the residence, but it's just a, about a five minute walk away. So sometime next year, if all goes well, uh, the, the office that is the embassy is going to be moving uh, to, that new, uh, to that new location. Uh, one of the, the neat things that an ambassador gets to do uh, with uh, his, her residence, uh, all the furnishings are provided. You can bring things to supplement if you want, but an ambassador is allowed to choose the art which is displayed uh, in the residence. And I decided to uh, choose the art of two artists I knew, actually from Massachusetts, and uh, uh, to, to arrange to have their art brought over to, uh, to Reykjavik. And this is a booklet that the State Department puts together about the art in a particular residence. And there are a few copies that are here. And Day, if you want to, you can, if you would, just pass them around if you'd care to look through it. No need to, but it gives you an idea of, uh, uh, of that piece of the, of the effort. Uh, this is the, some of that art that was displayed. You can kind of see these two pieces uh, there and there, but, but also the fans that are the creation of a, of a good friend, actually. Uh, uh, who's an artist in, in Somerville. So, so I was the first ambassador in, uh, first ambassador ever to Iceland, who actually lived in a place that was not cheek by jowl with the, uh, uh, with the offices uh, of the embassy, the chancery. And and that actually was something that worked out pretty well for me uh, because one of the things that, that I ended up engaging in, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, in the context of, of beer diplomacy, uh, is uh, uh, having, having functions at my residence or at the residence. Uh, I'd like to talk just for a, a sec, though, about about a couple of different things, and I'll I'll say just a little bit about this because I don't want to run into uh, time that that is to be set as an answer. But uh, uh, the business of the 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 activities that are uh, those of an ambassador are in some part kind of defined by the job. There certainly is the responsibility to follow through on those three uh, areas that I described a little bit earlier, which is protecting the interests of US citizens in country, reporting back to, uh, or gathering information and reporting back to the State Department. And then more broadly, uh, it is uh, work to uh, establish collaborations and improve relations between the countries and the citizens uh, of those countries. Two things about Iceland that, that fascinated me before I even got there was, I mentioned earlier, it's nearly 
100% powered by renewable energy resources. Uh, uh, most of that is hydro, uh, but a good part and an increasing part is geothermal uh, energy exploitation. And, and uh, uh, a second, and, and the, the set of energy issues is something that I was very intrigued by. It was part of Iceland as, uh, uh, as an innovator. Uh, they've really perfected uh, uh, their know-how in terms of extracting that geothermal energy and frankly are spreading that know-how around the world. Uh, another, though, uh, aspect of the of uh, the Iceland economy that intrigued me very much was the marine sector. And I talked about fish a little bit earlier. But what Iceland does that, that other fishing nations, uh, and, and certainly uh, that the United States does not, is it is very much focused on using all of the parts of the fish, not just the fillets of the salmon, right? But the skin uh, of, of the fish and tanning that skin into a leather type product. And there are a few samples that are, that are up here. Uh, and Day, if you want to, you can, you can pass them around. I'd ask that they all make their way back up here at the end of, at the end of time. But, but those products uh, or those skins, once tanned, can be turned into pocketbooks uh, of large or small size, uh, belts, as I'm wearing, even bow ties. Uh, and uh, the, the mate to this bow tie, I put into the hands of Barack Obama uh, last year uh, over the protest of his wife, I may add, who said, ew, fish skin. But uh, I'm not sure if he's worn it yet, but he said he might. So he, he gladly took it. And fish skin, of course, fish leather can be used, you know, for all sorts of other finished goods too. So uh, but I, I was very much taken by the innovation in the marine sector, and a particular aspect of that is something called the Iceland Ocean Cluster. And it is a, an organization that's comprised of established fisheries companies and uh, entrepreneurs, innovators within the fisheries sector. And so they have uh, uh, been focused on using the whole of the fish and in a context where, as I think we're experiencing in New England, where in respect to certain species, there are fewer fish in the sea, or at least certainly fewer, fewer fish in a quota that are able to be caught. Uh, uh, what Icelanders have done is stretch the value of each fish caught so that not only do you have the, that which we eat ordinarily, and not only do you have things like fish skin tanned into fish leather, but there, there is a company that has from cod skin treated, uh, made uh, a product that is a wound covering that actually promotes as applied to a burn or a hard to heal diabetic wound or or a battlefield injury, promotes the healing of human skin into that fabric of the, of the cod skin uh, uh, and any number of other products. This is uh, pre-cold. I'm not hawking any of this stuff, just so you know, but pre-cold is a mouse spray that's made from, from uh, uh, cod enzymes and it, and it protects against colds and so forth. There are a number of other products that I figured I'd bring in to, uh, to display. There's any number of, of uh, uh, 
you know, cod liver oil uh, supplements that, that have been devised in Iceland and, and products that are made from the chitin, the chitosin that is extracted from Arctic shrimp shells, right? Uh, and on and on. There's just a ton of innovation in this arena. The Iceland Ocean Cluster and, and its house, that is the, the building that it occupies, uh, has really been remarkable in developing this notion of greater efficiencies in, in utilization of what is taken out of, out of the sea. And it's something that I was fascinated with and uh, really determined to help bring to the United States. And I did work very hard on that while I was the ambassador and actually since, since coming back in January. Uh, so there's now an ocean cluster in Portland, Maine. And there's one that has started up uh, the New Bedford Ocean Cluster. And folks in, in Gloucester are very interested in, in working at developing one in Seattle and in South Carolina and Florida and, and in Alaska too. Uh, it, it, they offer, or the whole notion really offers more jobs for, for people in an industry, in a sector that's really been decimated. Uh, new opportunities for work uh, with new companies making and, and using these, uh, these new products and the opportunity to, to uh, be more environmentally sustainable because you're using that which previously just got chucked over the side. Uh, so, so those are those are a couple of industries that that uh, that I really was interested in, excited about, and worked very hard to to foment collaboration between and among uh, uh, both people and organization and and companies. My background as a lawyer was working with, in great part, entrepreneurs and the companies that they formed. So. This was something that I was familiar with doing and, and very much enjoyed doing. Uh, I want to uh, speak for just a moment, uh, and, and just a moment, and I'll uh, invite questions as follow-up for more information if any of you are, are interested in that, uh, but about uh, some issues that, that developed in, in to much more critically important matters while I was in Iceland. And one of them, uh, and perhaps chief among them, is the, the security-related uh, issues. You know, when I had my hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in January of 2014, that was pre-Crimea and pre-Ukraine and all of that which has developed uh, since then. Uh, I was sworn in and, and moved over in January. And soon after I, I got to Iceland, it became very clear that our US military was interested in reassessing uh, uh, a US presence in Iceland. We'd had a base there from 1951 to 2006. And, and over the last few years following the end of the Cold War, we had, we had stepped down our permanent presence uh, until it was eliminated altogether in 2006. There was, there was uh, an increased uh, uh, attention and hence lots of uh, focus upon what the condition of various uh, assets that the U.S. had left behind were in Iceland, and and it was it was a, a set of issues that became uh, very front and center to to my time there. Uh, the and and that was serious work. Frankly, left me very impressed with the leaders within our, our government and our military who are focused on, on security issues. I had a lot of fun being the ambassador. 
uh, while I was there. And I got to do, there are some things I was mentioning before that are really front and center part of the job and, and dealing with issues like security and defense uh, are, are most critical. And, and when those uh, uh, tasks are before an ambassador, those are the things that you're paying careful attention to. Uh, but I, I also, uh, there's a piece of time within uh, the day or within the work week, let's say, that really was my opportunity to do things that I, that I, that I wanted to do, initiatives that I wished to pursue. And these included things like the, uh, the ocean cluster and, and, you know, greater efficiencies in, in using uh, uh, fish and, and shellfish taken from the sea. Uh, and uh, in the, the context of developing personal relationships and, and the value that I placed, and again, it's not particularly novel, but it was something that was important to me, uh, I thought one way to, uh, to help to uh, develop those relationships was to, to uh, engage in beer diplomacy. Now, Icelanders love beer. Uh, they'd been deprived of it uh, because of a prohibition that came into effect in the mid-teens and lasted until... 1989, uh, uh, other spirits and wine had been legalized in intervening years, but beer, for whatever reason, I think the lobby wasn't strong enough, had not. Finally, March 1, 1989, beer was legalized, and Icelanders uh, uh, celebrate that every year on beer, on beer day. So that was something I knew about. So Icelanders love beer. Well, I like beer. So I had a notion that uh, uh, I would, one thing I wanted to do was to bring U.S. beer, wine, whatever, the stuff that I was going to be consuming in the residence, uh, to bring from the United States to have U.S. product. And there's a, uh, there's a place called, a brewery, craft brewer called Independent Fermentations. And again, I'm not shilling for anybody. I'm really not. This is just part of the story. But I, uh, I had met the folks who run this small brewery in Plymouth. And uh, they agreed to prepare a custom uh, brew for me and and so they did and and there's a label that they made up that's kind of based upon uh, our embassy coin uh, both sides of it you can see on the label and so rather than bring you know furniture or or <laughs> Uh, or, you know, too many books or any such thing over. I actually had, uh, with my air shipment, 25 cases of this. Uh, this is Honey Triple, and that's a Grotzer there, and I, I do commend them to you. I, I mean, I, I, I shall. And, and a, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, wine and stuff from New England as well as from around the country. In any event, uh, this, this beer was uh, a hit. I, I gave a bottle of each to the prime minister uh, for his 40th birthday, just like two weeks after I, I got into the country. And, and uh, the far, then serving foreign minister who, who became a friend, uh, uh, when I went to visit him, call upon him for the first time, I brought him uh, uh, one bottle uh, of this. And, and he told me a few months later, 
I said, well, have you, have you tasted it? He said, or have you opened it? He said, no, I haven't. My brother, my brother wants me to open it so he can drink it, but I don't want to. I just want to hold on to it. But anyway, uh, soon after I got there, right, it was January 23rd and beer day was March 1. We had a uh, uh, Paulo Frio, who was the deputy chief and a, a, just a very thoughtful, creative guy, thought that we ought to have a, a beer tasting. And so we did and, and uh, invited the prime minister and the foreign minister and, and a number of others uh, uh, across government, but also in the private sector and had a great time tasting 13 different beers, including the two uh, that I had brought with me. And as the, as the, um, uh, the crowd, you know, began to disperse, we'd finished our tasting and the food was nearly gone. Uh, it was about a uh, quarter of 11 and everybody had left except for the foreign minister and the prime minister. And the then prime minister uh, uh, said, uh, well, I suppose I ought to uh, give Siggy a call and have him come pick me up, but uh, let's just try one more beer. <laughs> and that kind of carried on until just before two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, and it, you know, we were, what was, what was good about it was, I mean, it, it was fun and funny to be sure, but this was an opportunity, right? With all pretense and formality. I mean, again, it's an informal country to be sure, but uh, allowed for this few hours, allowed for the opportunity for Paul Ofrio and I to get to know these two most critical members of the government of Iceland. Uh, and uh, thereafter, uh, whenever it was time uh, thought by one or the other of us, of the, the, the ministers or myself, to have a conversation about something, we would indicate to the other that it's time for another conference, I think. <laughs> and, and they'd come over. And so I mentioned, you know, the residents and it being something in a place separate from uh, the embassy offices. And I didn't realize it at the time. And again, this is the first time I've right, served in an embassy, but being separate and apart allowed for people to come in less formally, right? With less hoorah. Uh, and then to come into a setting that was uh, that was formal to some extent, but really uh, fundamentally an informal setting. And that, that's an experience that is the conferences with the foreign minister or the, or the prime minister uh, that we repeated several times to mutual benefit, uh, I, I firmly believe, and frankly with other ministers or other, or other folks as well. I was able and lucky enough to use this residents for a whole range of meetings, that whether it's from breakfast to, you know, after dinner gatherings as the case may or any time in between. And it was really quite, uh, quite delightful. I'm running out of time. Uh, am I out of time? Yeah, okay. Well, I am, uh, uh, I'm a very lucky guy. I have said that at every stage along the way. Uh, uh, I consider myself most lucky uh, to have been able to follow in the footsteps of, of uh, Day Mount and, and others like him who have served in this position. It was an extraordinary privilege. I worked hard at it uh, and, I'm, and I, I, I believe I left all that I had uh, on the field. Uh, I came back on January 20th. Uh, there's a 5 p.m. flight out of 
Reykjavik, uh, out of the airport at Keflavik. And five o'clock in Iceland is noon in Washington, and that's the moment at which the new president is sworn in. So I served till the very last minute that I could. I loved that job. It was a real privilege to serve there and certainly delightful to be able to tell you a bit about it. Thanks very much. I have a question about languages. Uh, did you prepare and learn Icelandic before you arrived? I, I did the best that I could. And I think, uh, and it wasn't as much as I wish I had, had learned before heading over and, uh, and in country. If there's, if there's one regret that I have, it's that I did not learn more Icelandic than I did. Uh, only about 99% of the people in Iceland speak English. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, there are only a couple of instances in my entire time there where I, I had a challenge in communicating and in those instances I did just fine. But uh, so it wasn't necessary. Icelanders appreciate it. I mean, it is, it is a and most folks in, in other countries who have tongues that are not English uh, appreciate it. Uh, but it wasn't necessary. I wish I'd done more. I really do. Sir, during your time, did you oversee any conduits of commercial activity between the United States and Iceland that you, are, you helped bring into existence or proud of or, or saw happen during your time so where some company here and some company there joined up in, in a common product, whether it's beer flavor or whatever? <laughs> yes, I, I spoke a, a bit about the ocean cluster and the companies that comprise it, and many of them are, are uh, uh, innovative within the marine sector. Uh, there, there are a couple uh, that, that I helped while I was there, and one of them is this company, Kerasis, that makes the, the wound covering from, uh, from Fishkin. And, uh, our, it, it, I think, has great commercial potential in the United States and is of great interest as well to our Department of Defense. But uh, Kerasis has now been approved for use in all VA hospitals across the country. Uh, it's got, I think, a Medicare number, if I have it right. Uh, and so it's a, it's a product that I think, I hope, will be increasingly used because I, I, I marvel at that, uh, at that product and its ingenuity. That's just one. There are others that uh, I helped to introduce. Uh, and and uh, one of the things about being an ambassador, and they may know this, is that, that you know, I step into to sort of a, uh, a stream that's flowing, right? And I happen to jump in at a particular point, and there are any number of things that are already going on. Uh, and there are any number of things that I might have helped to initiate, right, while I was there. They don't all get completed during the time that I'm there. So, so part of what I'm proud of is that I helped to move a number of things along. There are a lot of companies that, uh, uh, that are still pursuing some of the initiatives that we got started, and I hope they'll be successful too. Thank you. Question here. So I, I loved your story about uh, diplomacy, one beer at a time, or maybe two beers at a time. Um, um, Five cases at a time. <laughs> uh, I, w I wonder if you could comment on on the uh, state of affairs of the of the State Department. That the Foreign Service, um, my understanding from conversations with Ambassador Pelletro, is that it's. Um, been fairly decimated by uh, defections uh, due to policy 
controversies. And um, I wonder how you see things going forward from your perch. Well, for starters, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I have a political background. I described part of it to you. Uh, politics gets left behind when one serves as ambassador. Uh, I have to say I've reassumed some of the same kinds of activities since I've come back uh, because it's, it's important to me. In terms of the, the State Department, uh, I've got anecdotal information that is quite to the extent that I am aware of it is certainly consistent with that, which has been reported in the New York Times, among, among other media, uh, and with, of course, the goings on of yesterday and today. Uh, there's, there is, uh, I think it's safe to say, consistent with what uh, the Times is reporting, has been quite a, uh, a, high, a, a, a high number of uh, high-level departures from the State Department, whether it's been voluntary or it's been uh, forced. And, and certainly, uh, I know, not from being a career Foreign Service officer, but from having the privilege to work with, to learn from uh, many dozens of them, uh, how critical our Foreign Service and our, the professionals in our Foreign Service are to uh, American diplomacy around the world. I, I found uh, uh, very good reading and very forceful the recent article in the New York Times and the editorial of, I think it was Sunday a week ago. And I would commend that to your reading to all of you if you haven't. Would you say a word, please, about the implications of climate change for... Is that George? Yeah, hi, hi, Rob. Hi, George. <laughs> Good to see you. He's a plant. <laughs> no. George and I went to Phillips Academy together nearly... Well, it was 50 years ago. Hi. Uh, Icelanders are, are uh, uh, keenly... Uh, aware of climate issues and, and uh, it, very fortunate that there is a lot of steam and hot water not far below the surface, uh, the land surface. Uh, but, but it's a country that uh, will not be affected as much as perhaps others, you know, in, in the Arctic or, or closer to the equator perhaps. But uh, very much interested in, in, in being a country that's a model of uh, utilization of green energy resources, uh, development of more, and frankly, of spreading uh, that technology and know-how that has been developed in Iceland uh, in respect to uh, renewable energy exploitation around the world. Iceland doesn't have an army, uh, but one of the things that it does is as a member of NATO and OSCE uh, and, and other organizations, it lends civilian personnel to assist in other countries. And one of the things that Iceland has done for a number of countries is a geothermal utilization feasibility study. And one of, one of those that was worked on, and I had some part in encouraging it along, was in Ukraine, which is, I think many know, uh, rather reliant upon other countries for, for the, the gas primarily, which is, provides uh, heat and electricity in country. And if, if uh, they, they did a, a feasibility study for Ukraine that has holds some, some significant promise for at least low, low grade geothermal to provide uh, resource for district heating. That's not quite an answer to your question, but I think it, Iceland was very supportive of all U.S. efforts while the U.S. was the chair of the Arctic Council 
for the two years from the spring of 15 to the spring of 17 and is assuming the chairmanship in another year and a half and very interested in helping to promote those same ideals that are those promoted by President Obama and, and Secretary Kerry. Uh, Ambassador, uh, it, it's great to know that when my daughter and I visited Iceland in 2015, you were up there protecting our safety. So I'm going to start with that. But as you know, my father spent World War II in, in Iceland. Yes. And uh, you mentioned the situation with regard to the military. I know Keflavik was a major Air Force base for a long time. And you know, when we arrived, there seemed to be a lot of buildings over off to the side that looked like former military buildings. What did happen or what is happening with the the United States military presence there. Is there any? Uh, is well, any since presence? 2006, when we ceased to have a permanent presence, uh, uh, the, the bilateral security relationship, uh, our agreement with Iceland was, was updated and refreshed. And frankly, last year, while I was in Iceland, it was refreshed again, kind of updated to address then current circumstances. So, uh, we had uh, 5,000 military personnel and families there at the height of the Cold War that ratcheted down to just a few hundred that were there and then departed in, in 2006. Many of the buildings were turned over to civilian use uh, uh, that were easily adaptable for apartments or the like. There's a movie studio out there too in an old hangar. Uh, and Many others are maintained by the Iceland Coast Guard and as NATO facilities. And there is, uh, on the part of the U.S. and other NATO countries, uh, uh, a periodic presence in Iceland. There's uh, air policing that goes on and three nations a year spend several weeks in Iceland. Uh, the during my time there, I, I spoke of a reassessment, and, and uh, I think it's, it's publicly known, uh, has been publicly reported, that there's not an interest either on the part of Iceland or on the part of the U.S. for a, a re-engagement and a permanent presence uh, to be maintained in Iceland, but perhaps uh, 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 an up-tempo uh, temporary presence over the course of a year. Those who have the uh, the art books or the salmon leather, please bring it down to the front. <laughs> Thank you.